Ah yes, James Bond, 007. To me, Bond represents every man's fantasy. Because every man wants to win. Every man wants to say the right things at the right time, be suave and sophisticated, get the girl. Every man wants to be number one. Women want to be with him and men simply want to be him. Even if you're not a fan of Bond, chances are that you've at least seen one of his movies. Because the movies have now been around for 60 years. And in the recapping 007 series, I review all of these movies in the same in-depth format. Unfortunately, the first one suddenly got blocked after almost 7 years and over 400,000 views. Even though this is incredibly frustrating, unfair and sad, I decided to retaliate by updating and revising the first episode from scratch. So, join me as we're once again going to be starting at where it all began. going to be talking about the origins of James Bond, you have to start right here in Goldeneye, Jamaica, the spiritual home of Bond, the place where Bond was created inside this beautiful villa on a typewriter in the corner of the bedroom, overlooking a private beach and a tropical lagoon outside of the window. This is the home of Ian Fleming, the creator of our beloved hero who first introduced the world to the secret agent in 1953 with his novel Casino Royale. Before all that though, Ian Fleming was working in Britain's Naval Intelligence Division in the Second World War. Fleming was involved in covert operations, one of which was called Operation Goldeneye. His experience with spies and secret operations, along with his career as a journalist, provided much of the foundation and detail of what he eventually was going to end up doing. He told everyone that if he lived through this blasted war, I'm going to live in Jamaica and write the spy story to end all spy stories. And for a couple of months a year, Fleming did exactly that. He would retreat to his paradise home and would end up creating all of the James Bond novels here following a strict routine of mostly morning swimming, having breakfast in the garden and typing for about three hours straight. And directly from its debut, the first Bond novel had been a massive success for 1950s reading audience. Fleming had created a sophisticated character, a blunt instrument wielded by the British government whose features were mostly based on his own appearance. For the name of his agent, Fleming wanted something bland and got some inspiration from a field guide of birds. I wanted a really flat, quiet name. And one of my Bibles out here is uh, James Bond's Birds of the West Indies, which is a very famous uh, ornithological book indeed. And I thought, well, now, James Bond, now, that's a pretty quiet name. And so I simply stole it and used it. These unique and detailed spy stories clearly had potential for cinema. But Bond didn't immediately make it to the silver screen. As a matter of fact, a year after its release, Casino Royale was adapted into a TV episode of the American anthology series Climax, where James Bond was an American secret agent portrayed by Barry Nelson. It wasn't the most successful and 
ended up being buried and forgotten. Fleming was disappointed with this adaptation, continued writing many more Bond novels, and probably lost belief if there would ever be ambitious filmmakers who truly get it and could bring Bond to the big screen the right way. Enter Albert Cobby Broccoli and Harry Salzman, owners of Eon Productions, Eon standing for everything or nothing. And if you're talking about the cinematic spiritual fathers of Bond, you would have to talk about Cubby and Harry. Cubby was an ambitious filmmaker from an Italian family of farmers and Harry Saltzman was a Canadian filmmaker. They were Fleming's answer and they wanted to do it. Badly too. Once Fleming and the duo came to an agreement, the studios only wanted to back Eon Productions with one million dollars, which even at the time wasn't the largest movie budget. They had a green light though, they were going to be producing the very first cinematic James Bond film. And obviously the success of the series depended on the right casting of the leading man. Many actors were considered for the part of James Bond, including Roger Moore, who reportedly Fleming favored. Neither Fleming nor the studios were initially satisfied with the relatively unknown Scotsman called Sean Connery, who Cubby and Harry favored for the part. After Cubby's wife had mentioned that she found Sean Connery to be very sexy, that was it. Connery was going to be James Bond. Fleming thought Connery was too much of a country bum, lacking the sophistication he envisioned his character with. Fleming would eventually be blown away by his performance and even update Bond's background in the novels to be Scottish in tribute to Sean Connery. This is a testament to how Connery would end up doing and how iconic James Bond would end up becoming in the world, having guys like me still talk about him over six decades later. Apart from Fleming, Harry and Cubby, a large part of what made Connery Bond has to be attributed to director Terence Young, the perfect man to be asked to direct the first James Bond movie. This guy practically was Bond and mentored Connery into learning the ropes of sophistication. Fleming's sixth novel, Dr. No, ended up being the first cinematic experience to be brought to the big screen in 1962. This was something groundbreaking and unique, a film filmed in Technicolor, about to transport people into exotic locations featuring sex, violence and beautiful women. The novels were already popular, but was the world ready for what they were about to witness stepping into the cinema in the 1960s, only to be greeted by this extraordinary opening? <laughs> It's hard to imagine what it must have been like taking this in the first time watching in the 1960s. The first time Maurice Binder's gun barrel would show up on screen. The first time hearing Monty Norman's James Bond theme. Both of which would end up being incredibly iconic. Even seeing it today through the lens of modern eyes. At first you'd probably be like, whoa, a bunch of epileptic inducing circles. It didn't get more exhilarating than this, huh? But it truly is such an almost historic opening in cinema, the only Bond film to jump straight into the titles too. So the film introduces us to a British secret agent. Not the one we're thinking of though, his name is Strangways, stationed on Jamaica, where he is soon killed by a trio of assassins called the Three Blind Mice. His secretary meets the same fate, and the files on a supposed crab key and Dr. No are quickly taken off the record. Now, within these first few minutes of Dr. No, I always have to set my mindset to how dated a lot of this stuff feels. The actors in this opening scene are extremely wooden. There is a ridiculously obvious jump cut when the secretary gets shot. 
Monty Norman's soundtrack of the film hasn't aged that well either. Not long afterwards though, this dated feel quickly turns into being charming and timeless as we are introduced to the proper British secret agent we were thinking of, playing cards in a private club in one of the most iconic pieces of cinema history. I admire your courage, Miss... Uh... Trench. Sylvia Trench. I admire your luck, Mr... Bond. James Bond. Sean Connery's introduction as James Bond is just timeless. Right from the get-go, the man owns the part and just oozes that sex appeal, sophistication, the style. Director Terence Young's influence can't be credited enough because every little detail from Bond's cuffs on his jacket, the type of shirt, the cheeky and flirty facial expressions and the panther-like walk, he all just nailed it. Connery is the reason to watch this movie. One thing that always blows my mind is that Connery was only 31 years old at the time of filming this. I'm actually at the same age recording this video, yet he just looked more seasoned, something along the lines of his late 30s or early 40s. If you look at actors who are even a little older now, around a similar age, Darren Edgerton or Zac Efron, there often still is something boyish about people that age nowadays. I think it goes to show that Connery was from a whole different generation where coming of age just came around a lot quicker and childhood was short. But then again, he's from the generation that has lived through the war and we aren't. Anyway, Bond flirts a little with a woman he just met called Sylvia Trent, played by Eunice Gason. And kids watching this today should all know that handing out your number on a card to hook up later still is the way more suave equivalent to handing out your Snapchat. So Bond was called into the office where flirting continues with the introduction of Miss Moneypenny, played by Lois Maxwell, who would continue to do so in the first 14 Bond films. I always felt Connery and Maxwell had an unmatched Bond and Moneypenny chemistry. It's playful, it's fun, and you can tell these two would truly get along off camera. We are also introduced here to Bond's superior, M, head of MI6, or as he mistakenly says in the movie, MI7. It's a really confusing goof up that is minor but always puzzled me. In any case, Bernard Lee would also grow out to be a beloved character in the series and would end up playing M in the first 11 Bond films. Straight from the get-go, the relationship between M and Bond in the novels is truly captured here. The only man in Bond's life to have any sort of authority over him. Yet, there is a form of respect between them. The disappearance of Agent Strangways is explained and Bond needs to go down to Jamaica to investigate what happened. A very simple mission and premise that I think works well for being the first Bond film. Here we are also introduced to Major Boothroyd, played by Peter Burton, a seemingly minor character trading in Bond's Beretta for his iconic Walter PPK. Walter PPK, 7.65 mil with a delivery like a brick through a plate glass window. Die Hard fans will know that the name Major Boothroyd came from an arms expert, Jeffrey Boothroyd, who wrote Fleming a letter stating that a Beretta should not be the weapon of choice for a man in Bond's position and that he should be using a Walter PPK instead. Fleming was so grateful for this information that he did give his Bond this weapon in the novels and named his equipment officer after him. This moment is translated to screen here, but of course, Boothroyd would later be better known simply as Q for Quartermaster and would end up being played by Desmond Llewellyn for the simple fact that Peter Burden wasn't available in the next film. I truly wonder if he ever regretted that, as Desmond Llewellyn would continue to play Q all the way up until the 19th Bond film. Before Bond flies out to start his mission, he finds Sylvia Trent in his apartment. She's quite a stalker when you think about it. Bond only just met the woman that night, handing out his number, yet she tracked down where he lived and somehow broke into his apartment and slipped into his clothes waiting for him. Bond doesn't care how she did it though. I mean the girl's half naked and may as well bang her before the flight now that she's here. 
Despite being the sixth novel officially, it's quite suitable for Bond's first cinematic adventure to take place in Jamaica, knowing Fleming's background. And we jump straight into classic espionage goodness, as there are a bunch of people shadowing Bond as he casually strolls into the airport, being the sexy badass that he is. There's a guy with a mysterious sunglasses, a horny photographer girl, and a suspicious driver who claims that the government house has sent out a car for him. Bond just casually verifies this at the government house by giving them a call and this immediately tells us so much about Bond's character. They did not send the car out. I would be like, well, there's a dude who claims you did? Clearly he's working for the opposition, so you better send someone to keep an eye on us because they probably know of my arrival. But Bond doesn't say a word. He knows what he needs to know and is perfectly fine to play along with the guys acting as if there's nothing suspicious to find out who the guy is working for himself. Of course the guy doesn't want to talk and this ensues the first fight scene in the series. It's pretty decent. I'm still not a fan of Monty Norman's Tom and Jerry-esque soundtrack though. The guy would rather kill himself than talk though, using cyanide hidden in a cigarette. And Bond just casually pulls up at the government house with the corpse in the back seat, which I always really felt should have played the Bond theme as he pulled up. It's such a Bondian moment, it's kind of a missed opportunity. What you will notice with this film is that Bond has much more of a detective kind of role, trying to unravel what has happened to Strangways. As Bond drives up to his house, there is a blink it and you miss it moment of the actual three blind mice assassins casually walking in the background. It's a really nice touch that took me years to actually notice. Although modern audiences would probably associate Bond films with being big budget action movies, here in its early foundation, Dr. No is far from that. The movie takes its time with Bond looking for clues around Strangways' apartment and focuses more on the actual character of Bond, as we see him get his first signature vodka martini and go through the cautious routines of his job taken from the Casino Royale novel as he puts talcum powder on his case and a hair on the closet, typical down-to-earth spy stuff which I wish we saw more of in today's Bond movies. Through the bridge buddies of Strangways, Bond finds out that Strangways was into fishing lately and meets up with a man he saw in a picture earlier, Quarrel, played by John Kitzmiller. The movie plays the mystery card again to make everybody seem suspicious, to try and make us believe that Quarrel can be trusted. Right up until the moment at the bar where Quarrel only wants to talk with Bond in a back room. Oh, and Quarrel's bartender friend seriously has one of the best names in all of Bond. Pussfella. What a badass. So after Quarrel tries to threaten Bond into information, the sunglasses dude from the airport shows up and turns out to be the very first incarnation of CIA agent Felix Leiter, here played by Jack Lord. And they're all like, ha, nearly killed you Bond, but we're on the same side. <laughs> That's classic. Drink? So they all hang out in Pussfella's nightclub. There's some typical Jamaican music here and one guy always totally looks like he's having some sort of seizure here. I never got why this extra was dancing like this, but I bet it wasn't from drinking orange juice. It's also here where the mysterious photographer girl from the airport shows up again. So Bond decides to question her. But just like the fake driver, she reveals nothing. She does slash Coral's face with glass and the guy doesn't even flinch. I mean, damn, nothing? Really? He just casually wipes off the blood too, as if it's just been some sweat. Suspicion is raised though about activities on the island called Crab Key, belonging to a Chinese guy, and there isn't much known about him. Except his name, Dr. No. The movie does a good job into building up Dr. No and making you wonder what he's going to be like. The three blind mice show up again and try to assassinate Bond. Unfortunately, any sense of tension is once again taken away by the terrible soundtrack.
Besides the photographer girl, another person acting suspicious is one of Strangways' bridge buddies, the geologist Professor Dent, who clearly is lying to his teeth, claiming not being aware that the samples from Crab Key were radioactive. Feeling the heat from Bond, he goes down to Crab Key to warn Dr. No. And here you have to mention production designer Ken Adam, who designed many of the amazing film sets in the first dozen of Bond films. And his work is just iconic. Anyway, we still don't actually get to meet Dr. No, but we do get to hear his voice. Sit down. And it really sends chills down your spine while putting a smile on your face too. It's the first Bond film but they immediately nailed the larger-than-life villain archetype here. And it all just adds to the mystery of who is this guy already? Dr. No orders Dan to kill Bond with a tarantula, because, you know, just shooting him would be too easy. And he orders Dan to unleash it upon him tonight. And then it's already night again. Wow, that day just really got away from Bond. So... He just visited Professor Dent in the morning, clearly being on to him, knowing that he's lying, and just decided to hang out at Pussfella's bar for the rest of the day or something. Whatever he did the rest of the day, he's back now and found out that someone had indeed be snooping around in his hotel room. The hair is gone, fingerprints are on the telecom powder. Fortunately, Bond is prepared for these type of invasions, because he's a double O agent. Of course he brought a spare bottle of martini. I mean, God forbid he ran out of alcohol. So the actual nighttime moment of the tarantula crawling into his bed is actually, and I might be controversial here, a scene I still really enjoy. From what I heard, these tarantulas aren't exactly dangerous, and with that knowledge, it should take away all the tension of this scene. In the novel, this was a poisonous centipede, and Fleming described in great detail on which body parts the hairy thing was crawling. It still gives me the chills, but this, yeah, it works for me as a charming moment of the film. Sure, you can even tell there's a piece of glass at some point between Connery and the tarantula, but still, especially the shots of it crawling on Bob Simmons' skin, it works as a moment to really grab your attention in the film. Again though, the soundtrack is just laughably cartoony when you get to the end. You may have noticed throughout the film that some of the people secretly working for Dr. No have somewhat of a Chinese appearance. And I'm putting this mildly because none of the actors playing these characters are actually Chinese themselves. But I'm pretty sure the filmmakers were going for a look like that. As is the case for the government's house secretary, Miss Taro, who Bond immediately suspects is also working for the opposition, listening through keyholes and such. I don't know why the filmmakers didn't cast actual Asians for these parts. Were they harder to cast or something? Or was it a language thing? I'm not bothered by it, I'm just curious to why. So anyway, Bond knows all too well she's working for the opposition. So he does what every sensible man would do. Ask her out on a date. What should I say to an invitation from a strange gentleman? You should say yes. I should say maybe. Three o'clock at my hotel. Maybe. It still is one of my favorite lines in the entire series. Can't deny I used it a lot in the past too. So anyway, Bond goes over to meet up with Miss Tarot at her place instead. But she set up a trap and the three blind mice are on to Bond to try and stop him. And this ensues the most dated car chase in the series. I'm never bothered by watching classic filmmaking, so don't get me wrong. But the back projections here are just not only terribly noticeable, but the car in the background is gigantically out of proportion in relation to Bond's car. And it's weird because the smaller car chase after the airport scene has some actual shots that didn't use back projection and just looked so much better. So this scene ends up being very lackluster and not a prime example of the great action the series would later be known for. I guess you could point out the low budget the filmmakers had available, but they did seem to have enough budget to make this out-of-nowhere explosion that shows up, though. I think they were on their way to a funeral. 
So Bond shows up at Miss Darrow's house, who clearly is surprised that Bond has survived and did not expect him to show up at her door. All of the scenes at this house are some of my favorites in this movie. Connery is just a joy to watch in all this and I really feel that the scenes in this house should be used as the definitive audition for any future actors trying out for the role of Bond, you know, in addition to that scene that they use from From Russia With Love. Connery plays a dangerous side of Bond, clearly signaling he's onto her with the towel and telling her she's playing with fire and then casually referring to her wet hair. At the same time, he also portrays the effortless charm. You can really buy that had this been real life, this woman would have really fallen for the guy here. What's going on behind my back? you can imagine the reaction this would have evoked in the early 60s. Here you have the supposed hero with the audience being aware that she's working for the bad guys and we know that he knows too. Sleeping with her anyway to kill some time knowing that eventually someone will show up at her house. That must have been so completely different, so fresh for the time. That combination of portraying a dangerous man who is cunning yet charming, that uses the villain for sex and lets her be arrested afterwards before her nail polish is dry. That is James Bond in a nutshell and I love the guy for it. Even to this day, it's still engaging to watch. The best moments of the film continue here with Bond setting up a dummy in the bed ready to get the upper hand for whoever shows up at the house. Playing solitaire, preparing his gun, it's all just classic Bond. And indeed, what do you know, Professor Dent shows up seemingly thinking he's killing Bond, slowly realizing he just walked into Bond's trap. And the sheer confidence of Bond, perfectly aware that Dent tries to regain access to his gun, knowing he shot all of his bullets. Mr. Smith and Weston, and you've had your six. This to me is why this movie is fantastic and how it managed to successfully convey to the audience what James Bond is all about. I can't praise all of these scenes enough. So Bond and Quarrel set out to Crab Key to investigate and this is one of those moments again where the movie shows its low budget and primitive way of filmmaking as it's clearly supposed to be nighttime in the context of the plot but it's very easy to see it was filmed in broad daylight and was just filtered dark in post-production. You can even see the filmmakers try to attempt to get the clouds out of the frame as much as possible. It's quite hilarious. As Bond wakes up on Crab Key's beach the next morning, he wakes up to arguably the most iconic scene in the series unfolding before his eyes. Underneath the mango tree, my honey and me. What are you doing here? Looking for shells? No, I'm just looking. We are introduced to the Bond girl that really needs no introduction. Ursula Andrus portraying the innocent shell collecting honey rider. Internally cementing herself as the quintessential Bond girl. The filmmakers only had to see one picture of her in a wet t-shirt and they were like... Damn! Ursula Andrus was dubbed by Nicky van der Zeel, who would continue to dub most of the female characters in the early movies. It's very seamless and you hardly would notice if you didn't know about it. She actually appears quite late into the film and her role isn't even that groundbreaking. But having a woman emerge from the Caribbean Sea in a bikini in 1962 in Technicolor it's just timeless. You can bet there are lots of men around who saw this in childhood and will forever remember that moment as the day their testicles descended into manhood with the image of that half-naked woman permanently burned into their retina. And I always love the moment when Kroll runs up to warn Bond about a patrol boat who spotted them and pauses for a moment spotting honey like Son of a bitch! One night out and he picks up this chick! And I thought there were gonna be dragons here. 
Crab Key turns out to be a dangerous place indeed, as there are patrol boats shooting and shouting with megaphones, there are definite 100% no question about it, footprints of dragons roaming around the place, guards with dogs in the swamps, and to top it all off, there is even a danger sign. <laughs> The filmmakers attempt to give Honey Rider a bit more character by having a background story of her father getting killed and her using a Black Widow spider to kill the man at night, which is actually quite a dark side to her, but the whole background really doesn't go anywhere and wouldn't have made the film any different had it not been mentioned. If anything, despite the dark background and carrying a knife around and looking quite capable, she plays it quite helpless and scared. So both Quarrel and Honey are scared out of their minds for the supposed dragon roaming around on the island. Which I feel even audiences at the time must have found hilarious when it shows up on articulated wheels coughing out a flame. This is one of those things that reads thrilling on the page but ends up completely comedic translated to the screen. The comedy doesn't last for long as Bond and Quarrel try to shoot it and Quarrel is dramatically burned alive. It really wipes away your laughing at the tank and comes out of left field. Quarrel was quite the likable ally and the movie does well in raising the stakes here. Still though, a bright red t-shirt to come to Crab Key undetected. Great going on the camouflage Quarrel. So Bond and Honey are captured and are taken to Dr. No's facility. Before meeting him though, the pair needs to be decontaminated from radiation by taking a shower. And I regret to inform you gentlemen that Ursula Andrus isn't really naked in the scene. Believe me, I freeze framed the shit out of this as a kid. <coughs> After that, Bond and Honey are all of a sudden treated like first class guests, as if they had made their reservation in a hotel. This is an aspect of the movie I really like. They both get their own room, their own room in the villain lair. It's a classic Bond twist. Of course the pair gets drugged and somehow end up in bed after that. The filmmakers keep doing well in building up the villain, watching a movie that is named after him and then watching the first glimpses through a shadow and the reveal of having metal hands. It really keeps you gripped to see what he's going to look like and what his whole deal is. It doesn't take that much longer for us to find out at this point as Bond and Honey are invited for dinner with Dr. No. This takes us to another beautiful film set by production designer Ken Adam. For the limited budget they had, they did well in building something memorable that looks out of this world. And then, finally, after an hour and a half, Dr. No is finally revealed. One million dollars, Mr. Bond. You were wondering what it cost. Joseph Wiseman portrays the first cinematic main Bond villain and you can definitely say he's memorable and classic. Still though, he's supposed to be a Chinese man and the prosthetics around his eyes, especially on high definition, are hilariously noticeable and it really makes you wonder again why didn't they cast an actual Chinese actor for this part? It's not to say Joseph Weisman didn't do a fine job. It's just very curious. I'm glad they at least cast it, you know, an actual human. As in early production, apparently there were plans to make Dr. No a monkey. It's really weird. Fun fact I pointed out before, but the painting seen here is actually Goya's painting of the Duke of Wellington, which was stolen a year before the movie and Ken Adam placed it here last minute to imply the gag as if Dr. No had been responsible for the theft. So, dining with the main villain. This would become another typical Bond trope of the series, where Bond and the villain would play mind games as the villain would casually discuss his plans for world domination over a glass of champagne. The actual dinner these guys are eating is questionable though. I know they had a limited budget, but geez, you couldn't get more than a bunch of grapes? This is of course where Dr. No reveals he is a member of Spectre. Spectre? Spectre. Special Executive for Counterintelligence, Terrorism, Revenge, Extortion. 
Although Spectre only appeared in a trilogy of the late Fleming Bond novels, this criminal organization would be used for cinematic Bond for most of the Sean Connery Bond films. Dr. No's plan is revealed to be the toppling of American missiles from Cape Canaveral using an atomic radio beam, hence all the radiation at the island. And the plan is kind of... Meh. You could say it's relevant with the Cuban Missile Crisis going on at the time of the film, but in the context of the actual story, Dr. No could have really had any scheme and it wouldn't really change the actual plot all that much. To me, it's more of a side note instead of being an integral part of the story. So Bond and Honey are separated and Bond is locked up in his cell and carefully tries to find a way out. This whole aspect of Bond escaping through the airlock was in the novel, but with an entirely different purpose. There, Dr. No would experiment on Bond on purpose. He would give Bond a sleep drug and a dinner to have full stamina and would torture him through a whole parkour in the airlock in order to test human endurance on him with the water and the heat. At the end of the parkour, there would be a giant squid that Bond would have to face. It's a shame the whole torture aspect was dropped in the film, where it's just an overly convenient escape route for Bond and his really obvious stunt double, but nothing more. This all leads to the climax of the film, where Bond tries to stop Dr. No disguised in a radiation suit. It takes place on a film set that shows you the capabilities of Can Adam, even with a limited budget. It's far from the grand and larger than life ones he would design for the later Bond films, but it's definitely an early glimpse. Bond overruns the reactor and shit kicks off. This ensues a rather quick fight with Dr. No. I have to say, this whole climax is really underwhelming and definitely isn't the reason to watch this film. You would think they could come up with a more interesting fight having a villain with metal hands, but ultimately it's responsible for his downfall as he can't climb out and boils to death. With the overloading reactor, Bond has to quickly find Honey who is just tied down by the water, because just killing her would really be too simple. The water isn't even close to drowning her though, so it's quite a laughable moment. Apparently there was a deleted scene where crabs would surround her, posing more of a threat. But that was dropped for whatever reason and we're just left with just another underwhelming moment in the climax. So Bond and Honey make their escape from the island just before the whole place blows up and as would be a staple for the Bond franchise, Bond would end up with the girl, often on water, as the day is saved. <laughs> Oh, nice. She's really gonna give Bond a special thanks, huh? Oh, I can't be the only guy who was expecting something completely different here. So the day is saved, and for the last time, we are reminded that Dr. No has an awfully dated soundtrack. <laughs> So, that was another look at Dr. No. I don't think any of the filmmakers could have even dreamed this would be the start of a franchise that is still going 60 years later and that we would still be discussing this film after all this time. But the fact that we do, for such a large part, can be credited to the success of this film. Of course the series would improve upon its formula in the later installments, but so much of the groundwork was already laid out right here. I often see this film being labeled as vanilla, and though I can see where people are coming from with that, I respectfully disagree. To me, the main reason to watch this film definitely is Sean Connery, who knocked it out of the park straight from his debut and definitely was the huge reason this was so appealing and compelling to watch. The statement I made earlier of men want to be him and women want to be with him could not be more true 
when you see this man shine on the screen here as if he truly had been 007 for years watching this. Even to this day, his performance is exciting and gripping. You can only imagine what it must have been like watching this film when it was still brand new. The same holds for Ursula Andress, who, despite her rather underdeveloped role, ended up being so iconic and so memorable. I guess you could turn around the statement and say all women wanted to be her and all men wanted to be with her. Of course, the film definitely shows its low budget in areas that really have not dated well, but I think Dr. No should not be compared as an action movie too much. Because of course most later Bond films would outshine it in that area. You have to watch this for its compelling focus on the Bond character, going through the motions of his job in sort of a detective story, while at the same time being sent out to a beautiful exotic location, meeting extraordinary women, taking on larger than life villains, embodying that special Bond factor that makes these films so appealing to us Bond fans, right here from its very first film. Yes, Dr. No is not the best Bond film, and yes, the series would perfect the formula a few films later, but Dr. No is an amazing piece of cinematic history that you really just have to appreciate as a Bond fan.